welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and this is the 2024 Job Market series where I speak with young scholars entering the academic job market about their latest research on India. I spoke with Deepika Padmanabhan, who is a PhD candidate in political science at Yale University. Her research focuses on nationalism, language and self-determination with a regional focus in South Asia. We discussed her job market paper, Everyday Imposition, Language Promotion as a Nation-Building Strategy in Southern India. We talked about how the exposure to dominant national languages like English and Hindi impacts the identity of sub-national regional speakers in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, the politics of language in South Asia, the instrumental versus symbolic characteristics of regional languages, and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit mercators.org slash podcasts. Sometimes it can feel like a full-time job keeping tabs on the latest development in politics in India. If you're struggling to keep up, let the Grand Tamasha podcast be your guide. Grand Tamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, one of the world's most respected think tanks and the Hindustan Times, one of India's leading media houses. Each week, host Milan Vaishnav takes listeners on a deep dive into Indian politics, economics, foreign policy, culture and society. Over the past five years, Grand Tamasha has published more than 200 conversations on the issues that matter most to Indians and those who watch India from abroad. Featuring guests ranging from the comedian Hasan Minaj to the historian Ramachandra Guha and the philanthropist Rohini Nilekani. Grand Tamasha is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Subscribe now to get your weekly infusion of timely and provocative India content straight to your personal device. New episodes are released every Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern Time. Visit www.grandtamasha.com to browse past episodes and to learn more about the show. Hi Deepika, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Shruti, and for creating the space for job market candidates like me. No, this is super fun for me because I get to read awesome papers. Your paper I love because this is looking at linguistic diversity in India, which is not perfectly symmetric, right? There are some languages that are more dominant. There are languages that are spoken by more people. And of course, we have English, which is sort of this external neutral language almost and and the role that plays in India. And you're looking at how this affects local speakers, but not the typical stuff we look at, right? Like economists typically look at how it impacts them in the wage market and job market and things like that. You're looking at something completely different, which is how they view themselves in terms of like a subnational identity, which in India tends to be linguistic, like, you know, as Tamilians or Kanadigas, or as a national, more Indian identity, right? And you find that exposure to dominant languages outside of the state, such as Hindi and English, you know, when you look at the particular case of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, you find that the exposure to such dominant languages actually increases Tamilians and Kannadigas' identification as Indian. Did I get that somewhat right? And maybe you can tell us more about the paper. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, India is um, an extremely multilingual country. And while there are 22 kind of officially recognized, constitutionally recognized languages. There are so many more that are widely spoken. The kind of dominant languages, as we can understand them, are perhaps English and Hindi. And the promotion of Hindi as a dominant language or as a national language by political elites began before independence from British colonialism by nationalizing elites in the um, Indian National Congress. And even back then, there was widespread kind of agitation in Tamil Nadu at various stages and from subnational elites in general who did not want to equate the idea of India with um, one language and one associated ethnic group. So what happens after independence then is a continued effort to promote the national language And a corresponding kind of 
pushback from subnational politicians particularly again in tamil nadu up until 1965 where what what we kind of come to is a situation where hindi and english will be official languages but we don't really have any national language and we have kind of scheduled languages which are 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 the widely spoken languages and indian states function in their own scheduled languages in addition to to english however i think over the last couple of decades especially and a part of this is kind of increasing internal migration within india where a lot of hindi speaking migrants are moving to more employment abundant states so there's more linguistic contestation through that source and then there's also linguistic contestation that's coming from a renewed push for what's perceived as hindi imposition by the national parties in these states it then becomes important to interrogate what exactly imposition is in what ways hindi is being imposed and what its consequences are whether they're material and whether they're affective and what that does for subnational identity and national identity nationalizing elites have used a common language as a nation building tool in in you know early modern france and in colonized nations as well as post colonial projects such as the use of urdu in pakistan so this is not new but in multilingual country that professes a constitutional commitment to multilingualism how do political elites still impose a putative national language and not an official nat- national language but a putative national language and also why right that i think your paper also speaks to why they might mm-hmm. do that because there is this this deeper identity question at work so your result is super interesting because what you do is you actually expose people in tamil nadu and karnataka to you know short vignettes which are not political or any any you know professing for a particular identity or a party they're just exposure to a language in both english and hindi and you find that there is this sort of almost a, a shift or a change in how they identify themselves so what is the underlying mechanism at work from the individual's point of view like what's sort of going on in the mind of my let's say tamilian uncles and aunts who might have been exposed to your experiment absolutely i think what's really important to understand in this context is how political languages are and the political associations people make with these languages so this idea of everyday imposition i i define it as the process through which nationalizing elites kind of elevate the status of the national language by promoting its use in in routine interactions with the state so what this does as a as a process is it makes the national language more legitimate in public places through signs or boards in everyday interaction with bureaucrats or any kind of platform of the state and more legitimate specifically than local and subnational languages so i argue then that this process makes a subnational citizens when they are continually exposed to the national language it leads to important affective consequences because the non recognition of the local language by the state and instead the prioritization of the national language is associated with a sense of humiliation and a, a, a loss of dignity so downstream of this i i draw from social identity theory which is the the idea that we derive our self esteem from our group memberships and therefore want to be members of groups that have higher status i draw on social identity theory to argue that subnational individuals are made aware of their lower status in the state's hierarchy and so they incentivize them to emphasize the higher status national identity over the lower status in the state's hierarchy subnational identity and this starts mattering right i mean when now we're in the realm of politics and now this starts mattering whether we're talking about water sharing in rivers that are crossing state lines whether we're talking about how we split the fiscal pie you know where a particular project gets placed that is of national import like this starts mattering for everything if the core identity of the group is going to start shifting in a particular way is that a good way to think about why this is so important 
Absolutely. And I think it's also important because, as as you said at the beginning, why is it, why are nationalizing elites investing in this project if they anticipate pushback from subnational politicians and, and people? I mean, clearly, locals in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka seem very angry about having to go into government offices and see Hindi signs and and listen to Hindi all around them. So why do politicians continue to invest in this project? And it's perhaps important then to understand that this is a nation building project that works in, in, in some ways and which is the kind of pernicious nature of every, every, everyday imposition. So, you know, there are two ways to think about what's actually going on in your field experiment, mm-hmm. right? One way is something new is being communicated in Hindi and English, right? And these people are picking up on some information which is outside of the context of what happens in Tamil Nadu, mm-hmm. right? So even though the messaging is not political, it tells them something about the culture of UP or something about the culture of MP. And they're sort of picking up on that context and thinking about people and Indians outside of Tamil Nadu. So that's one possibility. A second possibility is that the exposure is just purely symbolic, right? There is no informational content. It's just their subnational identities tied to Tamil Nadu or Karnataka because the states were redrawn along linguistic lines in 1964-65. So this is just invoking an identity and that identity is, oh, People outside of Tamil Nadu speak lots of different languages and those in Tamil Nadu speak Tamil. Like that's, that's, it's that simple and that symbolic. So what do you think is going on here and how do we tease these two apart? There are two experiments in this paper. The first is an audit experiment with nationalized or public banks in Bangalore and Karnataka, which have become sites of language-based contestation with locals protesting not being able to use the lo- local languages, which is Kannada, to access services. So what I do here is I randomize the language in which service is sought. And I show that institutionally and bureaucratically, such banks, which are representative of national political elite and various kinds of government offices, all of these kinds of government offices prioritize Hindi over the national language. However, I find that materially the work gets done uh, so putatively the service is provided however using the local language leads to worse affective outcomes which is worse treatment by politicians and and feelings of recognition by the state so what i do with this is kind of document discrimination based on language and how it's carried out in subtle ways by the state and then to interrogate the consequences of such routine exposure to hindi in the setting of a state and therefore also outside of the setting of a state i employ a survey experiment which is when i expose people to completely apolitical vignettes in in hindi and tamil or kannada depending on what their local language is and and the reason I use apolitical vignettes is I've established that people are thinking of Hindi or people are interacting with Hindi in political spaces and it and are making these political associations with Hindi. Even when people are exposed to Hindi in apolitical contexts, such as in workspaces or through media and so on. We don't have to do the work of making it political. Languages are already carrying political meaning. So to answer your question, I, I make the case that this is kind of an affective and and not as much a material kind of process. So So it is definitely a symbolic kind of mechanism. So there's kind of other arguments people have made about how language might affect how you think about politics. The the first one is a cognitive pathway, which is common in, in the linguistics literature, which is when you speak a different language, the, the structure of a language uh, makes you think of politics differently and so on. And then there's a social pathway, which is when you speak a different language, you are exposed to people and subcultures and media that change how you think about your identity and politics. And then lastly, there's the associational pathway, where the reason people might be thinking of their identities and politics differently is because of 
the political associations of the language that they're exposed to. And I argue that it's really this associational pathway that's doing the work of altered identity. And the the main reason that I make this argument is half of my sample speaks Hindi and half of the sample doesn't speak Hindi. So it's really not about what is being spoken. It's yeah. just about recognizing that this is Hindi. Just recognizing that I'm listening to Hindi changes how it it kind of primes your identity and primes how you think about your position in the state and and therefore also how you think about politics your paper is really one in in the area of political science and what's happening in india uh, in that space but there's this whole other super interesting literature on bilingualism right mm-hmm. like bilingualism versus diglossia which are basically completely different things i love peggy mohan's book i don't know if you've come across it and and her point is that you know bilingualism is about two languages having essentially the same functional use in in an individual's life and and bilingual people are simultaneously translating right they can use either language mm-hmm. or even trilingual people they can they can, they can simultaneously translate and they can use any of those languages for any purpose whereas most indians i think tend to be diglossic which is they learn a language which is native to them something that's spoken at home or school or in their state and then they translate to other languages which they use in other contexts right so now you have multiple things going on in your paper because even the bilinguals it's not clear if they're truly bilingual or if they're diglossic because it's hard to test for that mm-hmm. because everyone says they're bilingual and maybe it's the diglossia which is making them have this association with something other than what they would have an association with if they heard kannada or tamil and then there's a second question which is you say that you know past a point the effect neither matters for bilingualism or diglossics like right it just just hearing something even if it sounds completely foreign and you don't understand a word of it mm-hmm. it changes something in a person's mind and how they think about their identity so there are these multiple layers going on which i find like totally fascinating about how that interacts with the politics of what's going on mm-hmm. absolutely and i think there it's important to note that as south indians we i mean south indians recognize hindi they recognize yeah. the script they recognize when it's being spoken because yeah. we see it in state forms we stay, see it kind of on 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 road signs or metro stations or in you know in speeches and so on even if they are not understanding what is being said you're still understanding that this is hindi and it is a political symbol and therefore kind of reminding me of my place in the nation so you know couple of follow up questions here is there a difference between hindi and english now both are dominant languages english has got a different association maybe some of it is political but a lot of it is economic mm-hmm. right so people who speak english especially at the you know native level fluency they have this huge wage premium this has been documented well by economists and so there's the idea of hearing english when someone's not fluent or or doesn't know english at all is there's a kind of elite structure at play right mm-hmm. they're made to feel inferior or as if they're not at the same level that is a little bit different from what's going on with hindi because with hindi it's more about demographics there are more hindi speakers there are more hindi speaking migrants who come to the southern states there's the national party typically tends to be hindi first before it speaks regional languages even in a coalition government right the speeches will be largely given in hindi and so on so is there a difference that you see between the two dominant languages and how people may perceive them yeah and you absolutely hit the nail there because while hindi is higher status and also a dominant language like hindi while english is higher status and also a dominant language like hindi it as you said is also politically neutral crucially it's also not associated with any local ethnic group right this is something i heard a lot is from in my interviews with tamil politicians they would say things like learning english doesn't make you an englishman and learning hindi will not make you a hindi wala but 
the difference here is Hindi is actually associated with an ethnic group in India or with ethnic groups in India, whereas English is not. Yeah. And the other kind of dimension is English is more aspirational. And one of the survey questions I ask people is why it's important for them to learn languages such as Hindi or English or their local language. And people respond with the economic incentives of learning English. But with Hindi, it's a lot of national integration or to to kind of understand the political narratives of the country and so on. So the effects that we see then are also driven by different forms of uh, different relationships of these two languages vis-a-vis the local language. So, you know, if I take your the results from your experiment and generalize them much beyond what you're writing in the paper, Mm -hmm. then do you think what we'll see is the people who are exposed to English and speak English or just passively exposed to English think of themselves more as global citizens versus those who are exposed to their local language or Hindi are thinking along more nationalist lines? Or do you think it's just way too complicated and that's a little too simple, uh, even though English is the lingua franca globally, especially it's the language of the internet, it's the language of integrating, you know, in sort of like the global supply chain or service sector and so on? So I definitely think those are the political associations that people might make. However, when we compare them to the local language or the local languages, Tamil and Kannada or whatever they might be in the other states, I guess it's also important to consider the the jo- the employment market and the and migrants here in this setting who speak Hindi as well as English. So then the local languages become much more critically associated with the subnational identity in a way that in in my survey response open ended survey responses I was finding that people were also associating English with the migrant and with a threat perhaps not to the extent that they're associating Hindi with migrants or with the kind of hegemonic state yeah, because with Hindi, the worry is the numbers are going to be very large. Whereas in English, the numbers tend to be small, but the economic impact is large exactly. and positive. Exactly. Right? So even with Hindi migrants, Hindi speaking migrants, the economic impact is positive. Mm-hmm. But the numbers being large kind of frightens everyone that they're losing their culture and, you know, all the other yeah. things. Like all the protests that are literally going on this week in exactly. Bangalore. A couple of questions, again, which are a little bit outside of your paper, but mm-hmm. I just want to pick your brain on this. Given that a lot of it is symbolic Mm -hmm. and not actually what is materially being communicated in the language, do you think the results will be similar or different or how different uh, when they're exposed to non-dominant Indian languages, right? So, for instance, if people in Tamil Nadu, like, you know, Karnataka is interesting because there are Tulu speakers, there are Marathi speakers and so on. So I'll stick with Tamil Nadu for the moment. You don't have traditionally within those regions say, Marathi speakers, right? That would be more Telugu speakers. But if they were exposed to Marathi or Odia, which are not nationally dominant languages, but are spoken by millions of people, do you think there will be a similar sort of feeling of national identity because they associate India's national identity with this kind of linguistic pluralism? So it's not a nation-building exercise kind of identity which is imposed by a particular kind of politics, but it's just sort of a nod to everyone in India knows there's linguistic pluralism. That's what makes India, India. You know, that's a great question because while while these states are Tamil dominant and Kannada dominant, there are various other language groups that also have a large presence in these states, right? So the the first point I'll make here is in in my survey experiment results, the first thing we see is exposure to the dominant la- uh, to Hindi makes people identify at greater rates with the Indian identity over their local identities. However, this is complicated because this is a kind of fractured nationalism because one might expect that. All a kind of implication of this were, is reduced nativism against co-national internal migrants, which is which is kind of the Hindi migrants who are also part of this nation that you are professing increased identification with. However, what I find instead is alongside increased nationalism, we see increased nativism as well against 
Hindi speaking internal migrants. So there is something very specific to Hindi going on here. And I, there's through my qualitative field work, I, I a lot of people in Bangalore specifically and language activists and language groups consistently spoke about how Bangalore has been multilingual for since really its inception, but especially since the 60s when there there was language contestation along a very different dimension, which is against kind of Tamil speakers at that time and so on. But they pointed to how Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam and other language groups um, had a large presence in Bangalore for many decades without this kind of escalation as we've seen in the past five to ten years. And I think it's important to understand this kind of Hindi-speaking migrant as a special subset of internal migrants which have the political patronage of the center, of the state. As a journalist in, in Tamil Nadu told me, he said, earlier the migrant was not hegemonic. Now the migrant has the imagination of national power and access to it. So when locals perceive that in their own state or in their own home city, when the state is catering to the migrant through language more than it is to the local. I think we see this complicated dynamic of a defensive claim to India and and to the Indian identity to try to decouple it from Hindi, but simultaneously this this backlash or nativism against the Hindi speaking internal migrant. So, and there, I think something there is also intertwined with the demographic anxieties, right? Because like you said, once upon a time, Telugu was a really dominant language. Tamil was very dominant because more people spoke it. And so there's always this fear that a lot of people speak because language at the end of the day is a network good, right? The more people who speak a language, the more useful it is to know it. And as those numbers sort of settle into equilibrium uh, and the fertility rates of these states drop because these states are also richer. Now we are literally talking about more people in a room who can speak Hindi and that is also becoming the network good language in a lot of these states. Plus there's the question of, you know, in democracy, even though we have a lot of, you know, malapportionment, you are one person, one vote for all practical purposes. So there's this like demographic anxiety on multiple along multiple lines, right? One is our language will become less useful and effective. And the other is also those people vote for someone different. And they will vote for this non-subnational power if we let them in and actually give them space and residence and domicile. So it's, it's kind of fascinating how all of this is happening simultaneously. But there's also like this weird side nation building yes. thing attached to it, right? Absolutely. I think I think the nation building alongside this increasing dynamic of internal migration and nativism and really high tensions right now in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, especially in the capital cities, is is important to understand as a symbolic and identity based process. And demographics are absolutely a large part of it. I often heard language activists in Karnataka say things like, you know, while we're, we're the highest taxpayers in the country and so on, but we won't decide what's going on in the country. It's those people in UP who are more numerous than us who will decide. Or, you know, as, as and in Tamil Nadu, there's a different kind of anxiety of as other people, as kind of non Tamilians come in, how that changes how people vote since, since there are since there's not kind of a significant national party presence. Yeah. Yeah. And and I guess the other dimension here is is of the class of the migrant because we see yes. two kinds of migrants coming into into the South. We see the more labor class migrant and then we see those who come in to work in the IT offices and the multinational companies and so on. And I think there are different kinds of anxieties associated with both migrants. With one, it's like economic hegemony, which is the network good value of the local language. And with the other, it is the demographic hegemony, which is, you know, they're just going to flood the state with their numbers and therefore they're going to change the voting patterns or whatever it is exactly. we care about, right? Like, is that a good way to think exactly, about the difference? Exactly. And, and sometimes I heard also in interviews with politicians things like, well, 
land costs much more here so we don't have to worry about it yet because these are circular migrants who will go back and you know they'll buy land in in bihar or orissa and and therefore economically we can kind of guard against this demographic change but i i suppose that day will have to come soon enough when when we have to recognize the migrant and provide kind of constitutional and fair minded inclusion means yeah and the funny thing is they want the migrants right because they, they these states have become too rich to be able to attract workers of a particular yes. uh, you know uh, at a particular wage level to do their bidding so it's i mean bangalore will come to a standstill without migrants right i don't think we'll be served at least on time at sarvana bhavan <laughs> if Completely. we didn't have migrants working in the back in the kitchen and so on so so it's like a, it uh, i guess what i would say is anxiety is not always economically rational mm-hmm. right that that's where uh, we can uh, we can leave that you know i also found you know the best kind of pay- papers always make me think about how would i design an experiment to tease out all these multiple parts and i thought a really fun i mean when i say fun because i'm not the one who would have to do this experiment uh, someone like you would have to do it would be looking just at tamil nadu and then mm-hmm. exposing them to vignettes in different dialects of tamil right because tamil is also spoken in sri lanka which is a completely different dialect because i've heard sri lankan tamil and i can't understand anything right versus tamil in tamil nadu and does that similarly invoke someone's feeling of indianness because it's so clearly like a different language you know you don't see that so much with bengali there's a slight difference but it still very much sounds like the same language with the same sort of you know emotion or symbolism it might evoke but with sri lankan tamil and indian tamil i think there 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 might be quite a difference do you think you will find that like exposure to a dialect which is so clearly from another mm-hmm. country and this is a country that's literally geographically separated it's been geographically separated through mythology for you know millennia at this point because of you know lanka and everything that's happening in the ramayana so What do you think we will find if we did design an experiment like that which is not about a dominant language but just thinking about does this evoke national and subnational identity or only subnational identity Sure I mean I think that's a great question because not only are there varieties of Tamil in Tamil Nadu and 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 Sri Lanka but there's also varieties of Tamil within Tamil Nadu that signal yeah. caste and subregion and so on yeah. and which actually came up a lot in my interviews where yeah. uh, pe- people would try to kind of figure out where I'm from is like are you are you from Coimbatore I I they know where you are yeah, exactly right. exactly It's like my fair lady I'll tell you I have a great uh, linguistic origin story I'll I'll tell you after we finish talking about the paper but yeah they know where you're from Exactly and and they're trying to kind of place you in the caste yeah. hierarchy as well because Yeah I'm know, sure they call you Ayer Ponna or something like that right Well so I uh, there was a, a bunch of confusion about that because in some interviews yeah it did come up so your surname but it's not matching up with the kind of Tamil you're speaking and so on and yeah because Because, you know the, the kind of typical brahmin tamil is 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 perhaps different from the madras tamil yes, and, and exactly so which on. is more colloquial so, exactly and i think each of each kind of tamil would would then prime a different kind of politics i suppose because if we hear the if if you hear i think palakkad tamil for instance yeah it's completely different yeah and you're not i i'm fairly certain that wouldn't prime the kind of dravidian social justice politics when people hear yeah. it but coming to your question about kind of sri sri lankan or elam tamil versus the, yeah. the tamil that maybe you and i would speak i think given the high degree of solidarity with the elam cause in tamil nadu and and also a, a parallel rise in in kind of tamil nationalism in in tamil nadu right now with with the ntk and so on I think it would still prime a subnational rather than national identity but th- but that is you know me speculating and without yeah having done the experiment No it would be super interesting to see that because honestly that is the one dialect of Tamil I find very hard to understand yeah. I don't claim to understand it at all uh, my linguistic story is actually interesting so this was during the tsunami so it's already like 20 years ago right and uh, I had gone there to do some tsunami relief work and I'm born and raised in Delhi 
So I never grew up in Tamil Nadu. I've only visited, you know, Chennai now, erstwhile Madras for short vacations and weddings or something like that. And I was taught Tamil by my grandparents. So mm. I still speak Tamil, not like Madras Bhashai, which is much more colloquial and much more mixed, both ethnically caste, you know, regional and all of that stuff. I speak Tamil like they spoke Tamil in Tanjaur and Mayuram like a hundred years ago, because that's what my grandparents spoke. So... I show up in these villages and, you know, they needed one Tamil-speaking person heading like the field sort of, you know, support in each of those places. And I was one of those. So they just called me Ayer Ponnu the whole mm. time, right? And I didn't quite understand. I'm like, what are they talking about? And then they kept telling me that I am from there. So I'm like tra- trying to tell them that I am not from here. I am from Delhi and... I was born there and I was raised there and it's the first time I'm coming to your village. And all, and you know, I was mostly talking to women and these these were all fisher women, right? Mm-hmm. They all were so insistent that I'm from there. Mm-hmm. You're okay, one and of I start naming villages. So I kind of got tired of this and this is, uh, you know, cell phones were around but I had to go to an STD booth. Uh, so I call my parents and my grandparents and I'm like, where are we from? You know, because my parents were born in Bombay and Bangalore. Like, really, no one is from the village except my grandparents. And then my grandparents tell me where they're from. And both my maternal and paternal grandfather were within five kilometers of where I was standing. Oh, wow. So they're right. One, they were right. And they can tell how I sound. And I sound exactly like my grandparents, right? Because I really, it's a very uncontaminated, you know, I mean, I speak Hindi like a local Delhi colloquial Hindi person, but I speak Tamil like you speak at home because there's no external influence. So it was like really freaky. And also like the first time I understood that it doesn't matter that I'm not been to a particular place, but that's my identity. It's been baked into, you know, my caste, my language. This has been baked in intergenerationally and there's no way out of it. And that's when I was also asking my parents, are we Ayers? Like, what is going on here? Why do they keep calling me that? And my grandfather was like, yes, but it is also a shorthand for you're a Brahmin girl is how they would say Ayer Pinna and, you know, things like that. So it's just uh, like a personal story, which just suddenly made me realize my own Tamilness, if that's yeah. if that's a word. And this this stuff really makes a difference if for anybody doing interviews or qualitative work and so on. It's they respond differently depending on who they think you are. Completely. And for for me it became important because I you know, I'm this my my surname indicates that I'm from Tamil Nadu and my parents are from Tamil Nadu, but we're actually from a Telugu speaking family. So to explain that kind of origin story but also kind of not signal that too much perhaps was challenging but you know it's did they yeah. constantly ask you if your family is named after the temple they were constantly asking me if i you know if my family named anyone in the like yeah. in my parentage after a particular temple and incidentally my dad was named after that temple so it was like they got so many things right about my family it was really free you know I honestly thought I'm in like that opening sequence of My Fair Lady <laughs> where you know Henry Higgins is telling everyone how to catch a you know a horse buggy or a taxi cab to get to where they need to get to because of their dialect so uh, yeah uh, Do you have time to chat a little bit more about your other research in Tamil Nadu? Because you are writing about food and film and politics and propaganda. And all of these things are super fascinating to me. So what can you tell us about these papers? Yeah, I I think so. Anybody interested in Tamil politics is generally also tends to be interested in how political Tamil film is. You know, for myself, the Tamil I know is mostly from Tamil film. And therefore, a lot of the politics that I personally own are from Tamil film. And this paper is kind of advancing the, um, this theory that political film really serve as a heuristic tool to understand an actor politician more than a propaganda tool to change people's politics. So while I also have a survey experiment that's currently in progress, a bulk of the evidence of this interview uh, of this project comes from these in-depth interviews I conduct with 
Tamil film fans. So in 2021, I conducted around 20 interviews with Rajni Khan's fans as well as oh, Kamarasan yeah. fans, which is that is beyond politics. That's religion now. <laughs> uh, exactly, and how how kind of even people's religious identities and what signals are they looking for in in these actors' movies? So it's. An average movie go goer in in Tamil Nadu at least is very politically savvy and they're able to understand political Absolutely. kind of signals. So, an average fan is able to talk in detail about why did Rajnikanth do a certain movie such as Kala, for instance, and therefore yeah. what does that signal about his politics on caste, and therefore. How can I then educate myself on Ambedkar and Periyar and so on? Yeah. And right now, I'm in the process of interviewing Vijay fans, which has also been hugely illustrative because a lot of like non-fans uh, think about Vijay as, as very apolitical and we don't know yet. And, and his party platform has not been revealed and so on. But I, I think yeah, that's the other thing, right? In Tamil Nadu, a lot of the actors turn into politicians or at least have political platforms which will support the existing party structure yeah. and and co you know have coalitions with them and so that's the other by the way this is I am curious to read this paper because my own family has political and religious divide between Kamal fans and Rajni fans so uh, <laughs> it would be super fun to read this absolutely my, my I, I, I will say I had the best time working on this project and people are so excited to talk about politics and film yeah, and it's also like, I mean, one is the kind of films they choose, which is now we're going one layer under. Like, you know, then it's like this dynamic game between what the star thinks the fan wants and therefore the stars will start choosing those particular, you know, mm -hmm. themes. How much of it, you know, there are also these very significant tones on linguistic nationalism and politics in the films uh, themselves, the kind of Tamil they speak, the kind of remarks they make about those who are not Tamil speaking or those who are outsiders and uh, those who are English speaking, which is typically like the dainty, lovely girl who, you know, enters whatever context uh, is going on in the movie. So, yeah, this is uh, fascinating. So I can't wait to read that paper. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 as you said, linguistic cultures are are also politicized in these films and and. The idea of a Hindi speaker, or even the the Setupanu, or or and so on, is yes. um, baked into these the film yeah, I culture. I forgot Setupanu. That's such a lovely word. We're going to have a fun time translating that in the transcript. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> No, no, yeah. no. I keep using all these other words. And then, you know, when we're doing the transcript, you know, uh, I got to do this. Uh, my, I'm going to also send this to my uncles. My uncle told me once, uh, once told me something quite lovely, you know, very ardent Tamar speaker. And he said the only Hindi imposition I'm willing to live with is one imposed by Mohammad Rafi, which is both dating him. Yeah. And also like how a lot of Tamilians got exposed to Hindi to start with by these beautiful songs that were sung by Mohammad Rafi and Kishore Kumar and so on. I think even Ram Guha has a passage in his book on mm. how you know Indian cinema and Indian songs were like this kind of nation building exercise yeah uh, and this kind of I mean films as a modern creation of a uh, imagined community right that, that's how communities are created in in some ways and and as you said I, I think that's not uncommon in southern India to a, a lot of people talk about how we watch Bollywood, we enjoy Bollywood. We just do not want you to force us to speak Hindi, whether in state in state settings or 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 by migrants and so on. But I can choose to learn it if I want and engage with it on my own terms. So, last question: Do you think all this is just going to disappear with AI and simultaneous translations and things like that? Like, I mean, people are literally working on technologies where, in real time, if you're speaking in Tamil, I can hear it in Hindi, and mm -hmm. you know, there are devices being made like that. Do you think all this will just disappear in twenty years, and we'll wonder what the fuss was about? Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because a lot of the language activists in Bangalore City actually. Uh, also have some of them have uh, some of the leadership also has like long careers in engineering and IT and so on so these are people familiar with technology and uh, advancements in AI I think one thing that's important to think about here is the political will to actually do this 
So even right now, if you go to most of the government of India websites, very few of them go beyond English and Hindi, right? And that's already Absolutely. very easy for people to do. I remember during COVID, there was a gap before which services in for, for the kind of uh, health apps became available in the local languages. So I heard things like, you know, I remember this uh, activist in in Bangalore telling me Google sitting in California can understand what I need but you know but but these people can't understand that it, they can leverage technology and there's also then a simultaneous effort which we we've seen in the past kind of to modernize Tamil vocabulary but right now we're also seeing this effort to to modernize or to adapt Kannada vocabulary to technology and so on. So I think technology will definitely change how we engage with language and language politics. But but I think political will and the political dynamics is is crucial variable here. Yeah, no, this is fascinating. Looking forward to read all of this. Thank you so much for taking time to talk about your research with us. Thank you so much for having me. This uh, I had a great time and it was so nice to be here. Ideas of India is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Help us grow by giving us a rating and leaving a review. Follow us on Twitter at S. Rajagopalan and at Ideas of India. Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com.